Every successful person has faced difficulties in their life and career. My guests will share with us the challenges they have overcome on the road to success. Every week we'll follow their story right here in Life with me, Patty Boulay. Hello, welcome to Life with me, Patty Boulay. Now my guest today is very special to me. His name is Phil Wilmot and he is an award-winning director, playwright, arts journalist, teacher, founder of London-based theatre company, The Steam Industry. But why I say he's special is because Phil cast me, me, as Judy Garland <laughs> in one of, his, one of his shows. Now you can get more out of the box than that. <laughs> well, it, it, was, it, was, um, it was fantastic because you really made those songs your own. Um, which is what, what I wanted. If you remember, it was a project called um, The Night We Buried Judy Buried Garland. Buried Judy Garland, yes. And it was about the Stonewall riots that... Uh, uh, and this whole generation don't know about the Stonewall riots, but um, at the time, in the, uh, in, the, in the early 70s, I think it was, uh, the, the, the gay community in New York was really oppressed by the police, um, and there was this night when everyone had enough, uh, a gay bar was raided, and it started riots on the streets, and lots of gay, good things about gay rights came out of that. And the day before, Judy Garland, it had been Judy Garland's funeral. Um, and so she was well on everybody's mind, so it seemed to me a good idea to have Judy Garland's songs as the, uh, as the core of this, this piece of theatre. But of course she meant different things to different people. Yes. So I wanted a range of singers who could take her material, and not imitate her, but really make them uh, make them their own and and draw upon like that the, the kind of strength and the determination that she had um, and put their own version of it into the song so that's what we did well you certainly did that oh we were dressed in the tuxedo and the fishnet tights and and the trilby hat and the trilby ha hat it was just fantastic oh you had somebody else play judy garland because we were oh, Andy Bell from Eurasia. Andy Bell from Eurasia. And he was wonderful too, actually. Yeah, yeah. Wasn't no, he? He, he brought a tremendous amount to those songs. Uh, it was very haunting. But I've, I've got a photo somewhere of uh, it opened because it was at the Shaw Theatre, wasn't it? Was that the Shaw? Big, That's big right. Stage, yes. And the curtain went up on about twenty people, uh, male and female. Um, dressed as Judy Garland, Judy Garland and that's... it was the most amazing uh, sort of opening. It was, and then you brought on your black Judy Garland. I brought on my black <laughs> Judy Garland, yes. <laughs> that was, it was just wonderful, and, and for many years I just thought, what was he thinking? <laughs> I mean, I'm thinking, I don't know any other director that would have taken that risk. Well, you've always been very supportive of gay rights, haven't, haven't yeah. you? Yeah. Um, uh, and, 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 and I knew that about you. Um, and of course, I knew you were a great singer, so I, I, I was really curious how uh, you would bring all that to these classic Judy Garland songs, and um, and it was terrific. Well, it's it's something you said, the strength, okay? Um, her strength as a performer was, mm. was amazing. Mm. But when I looked into her life later, I found kind of like a loneliness and a lost mm. person, which is really... And I suppose this is why, really, Stonewall, they could, you know, maybe identify with her because she had such inner struggle mm. and yet had to put up this strong front. Mm. You know, I, I always used to say, you see, black people went through hell, but the, the only problem is we didn't have to come out. Mm. You only had to look at us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, throughout history, you know, I had this conversation with a, a taxi driver once who was... Irish in London, okay, London taxi driver, and he, he's saying to me, oh, it's terrible, because bombs, you know, the IRA was bombing London, mm. and he said, it's so terrible to be Irish now, and I'm going, really? Mm. I'm going, you see, you don't have to speak in an Irish accent, you can get away with it. I said, look at me, I put my nose through the door, poof, oh. <laughs> and he said, I've never thought about it that way. Yeah. I said, yeah, try being black, then <laughs> you know, and he said, you know, you made me think about it differently, and I think that is what they identified with her mm. and she had which is why they followed her because there there is an inner struggle that she had mm. and a vulnerability which she's very she's vulnerable not a, a, she's not afraid to show that vulnerability 
Uh, the, the, you know, these days people think you have to be like kind of attack, attack, dazzle, dazzle, but actually yes. to show some vulnerability and some humanity is really important. I know. I learned that from Michael Dennison. Oh. I learned that from the late Michael Dennison and because he told me that. He said, people, you're vulnerable. You appear vulnerable, and that's what people want to protect. Mm. I'm thinking, I'm not vulnerable. I'm pretty tough. <laughs> mm. yeah. But, you know, I, I, it, it's, not, it's not a toughness of, you know, brashness or... No. But... I have been through things that have toughened me. Well, to, to perform um, a, like a classic blues song, you, you, you have to be oh, yeah. prepared to dig deep and oh, share it. Oh, yes. Because I'm doing a show at the moment I wrote called Billy and Me, looking at the life of Billy Holiday. Oh, wow. And then comparing it to my life. Yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah. So I had to do a lot of digging. Uh -huh. And in digging, what I found was, I thought, whoa. It's like, Phew. and then I thought, I've got to find humor in this because mm. I've got to entertain mm. people with this and yet keep her human, mm. keep her vulnerable, keep her strong. Mm. All those things that she had, and I had to find that and write it into this show. And uh, I think I did that. It's very, it's quite funny. And then I bring my mother into it and I okay. talk because we had, actually my husband, you know, Stephen pointed out that we had similarities right. in our childhood, yeah. in our upbringing. So I kind of went into that because she saw, witnessed the lynching of young black men in the South. And I witnessed a young man being deliberately burned alive mm. and also body blown apart during the Biafra War. So I kind of just drew those, that was the only actually bit of the show that is really maybe dark and mm. it's only five minutes, um, three minutes because it leads to strange fruit. Right. Okay, but the rest of her songs, then I just find humor out of it, you know. Yeah, yeah. Like, don't explain. Yeah. And I just put it in, con you know, the American con context and the Nigerian yeah. <laughs> view. And right. it makes the audience really laugh yeah, about so, something that can be dark. So you're, you're, it's an interpretation. It's not an imitation, which would oh, be no, very no, no. dull. It's, it's, it's no. making it's not the songs a tribute. live again. And yeah. Great. It's not a tribute. It makes the song live again with a story round each one that nobody would have even looked at and mm. thought of. You know, you must come and see I'm it. I'm going to, yes, yeah. But okay, so I want to talk about Bloody Mary, me playing Bloody Mary in South Pacific. <laughs> Which was a big you. Hit looked you. at me and then you made me play Bloody Mary. I, I, was, I was thinking, I wonder if we can um, uh, strip Patty of some of her glamour just a little bit. <laughs> and uh, you, you were very brave and, and you, because you, um, you always uh, beautifully uh, quaffed and turned out and you're very brave to. Um, certainly in those early scenes, not appear like that. And again, that gave you a tremendous vulnerability, I think, and people really responded to that. Oh, it did. But I played uh, I played Yum Yum years ago when I was young, and I was in hair, and that was actually funny enough, that was after I just came out of a convent. Oh, okay. And they couldn't get me to look like a hippie. Right. And I had a good reason for that, because I said, what is a hippie? Yeah. He said, they're fighting for freedom. I said, freedom? Freedom? I said, but surely your freedom is inside you. All right, yeah. <laughs> Nobody else is going to give it to you. You uh -huh. need to find it inside you. So I'm going, I've got mine. You know, you dress me however you want to. You can tear the pieces of what they did. They right. kind of, the, the wardrobe woman said, I give up. <laughs> she, said, she said, whatever I put you in, you look like you're going to model it. Okay. So I said, well, in that case, I don't think I'm ever going to be a hippie. <laughs> No. Am I? Well, you, you've, um, you've had to, um, in a way, create yourself, didn't you? Because you came from uh, you know, quite a, a, a troubled uh, community and you had to invent yourself. Actually, I, funny enough, I never had to invent myself. I always had to be me. See, my okay. mother, my mother is very glamorous, okay? She's actually born a princess to a oh. very... Um, known, you know, king in the South Nigeria. And, but we don't actually, we never dwell on that. Mm -hmm. And she went through hard life. She had nine children and two marriages. She married when she was 15. And yet she learned to sew, which is why, because we never had, we never had dolls. Oh, okay. Clothes. Right. 
Okay, she she and she was brilliant. Actually, she was one of the people she was studying at London School of Fashion when she was stitch, stitching beads on the the Queen's coronation gown, mm. and uh, absolutely. Everybody always said to us, none of you are going to be as beautiful as your mother. And I agree. Right. She's a very elegant woman. So I had that. Right. But on the other hand, she was a strong mm. woman. Mm. I, I tell stories in, I don't know who's interviewing who here, but I, <laughs> 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 I tell stories in Billy and Me of how she actually, you know, protects her children. Because right. this man came, one of the stories, this man came to look for my sister, one of my sisters who was about 15 at the time, she's still in school, but she attracted men like flies. Right. She looked like a black Sophia Loren. She was just, you uh -huh. know, gorgeous. And this important man came, and this was a genocide. We were being massacred. We were the ones being killed. Okay? Right. And this man comes, and dad was political asylum and political asylum in Ghana under President Krumah's mm -hmm. government. This man arrived in his chauffeur-driven car and asked for my sister. And we thought, whoa, what? So we sent him up and said, she's upstairs. We mm. knew she was at school. <laughs> Mommy was upstairs. You see, Mommy had this cane, mm. like a horse whip. Mm. She used to keep at her side. That's how she disciplined okay. all of us. Wow. <laughs> oh, yeah. I knew the length of it, and I knew how far she could move. Because right. she, she had, by her mid-30s, she's had her nine children. So people didn't realize, you know, she looked like she was one of our sisters. Oh, right, so this okay. man goes up there, very rude, didn't even say good morning or good afternoon, just said, you know, is, is uh, you know, my sister's name. Is she here? <gasps> we went, whoa, because she was a strickler for etiquette right. and good behavior. Well, the next thing we know, this poor man came tearing out of a room, chased by this horse whip, and I oh. tell you, that thing can hurt. She whipped him all the way to his car. Oh, wow. That's how tough she was. Yeah. Screaming at him, you're looking for my little child? <laughs> yeah. Just, uh, so, you know, she was a strong woman. But that could have made you hide in, in, inside yourself. That could have made you like a, a shy person. I was very shy when I was growing up, but, but for the different reason. I wanted to protect her. Right. Because I was looking at this woman looking after nine children. Mm. And she wasn't educated herself because they didn't educate you know, she educated herself as she educated us. She sent all her children to universities. She had one pilot, one aeronautic engineer, one industrial chemist, one physicist. Oh, she was incredible. And me. <laughs> and did she see you in the, in the West End? Was she she did. That? She was shocked because she said to my husband, of all my children, I wouldn't have expected her to do this. Ah. You got to bear in mind I was going to be a nun. <laughs> right. <Okay. laughs> so you couldn't get any. You couldn't get any. But I'm always myself. Yeah. Because my strength is in being me. So what you see is what you get. Mm. I couldn't possibly, um, except on stage. The only time I've really let go of myself was playing Carmen. Ah yes. Okay. This is the only time I've let go of myself because I could identify with her, with the market women in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. I could see that character. But I never let go of myself. I can dip deep, deep for something, mm. but I'm always me because mm. I'm very comfortable, mm. you know, being me. And that's where my confidence comes from. So that's what you see. Maybe that's what you saw and thought, you know, because I am vulnerable, but I'm also very strong because mm. of the things that I have. Well, you, don't, you never apologize for yourself. No. And that was, that's what, that was what you brought to Bloody Mary, I think, that, that, <laughs> that she was able to, she was able to sort of see the faults and limitations in her life, but she wasn't going to let it uh, get to her. She was going to tough it out. And uh, so that, I think that's why but it worked so well. You were a brilliant director because oh, you brought that you. out of me. Oh, thank you. Because yeah. I've always said that your director is your mirror. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you can bring what you've got to a director, but he then turns it into what it should be. Mm -hmm. Okay, because he tells you that's working, that's not. You were, you were the first director to do that for me. Because oh. I found that every director kind of expected you to bring, to tell them what they should be doing. Right. But you didn't. No. I mean, come on. You cast me as Judy Garland, for goodness <laughs> sakes. <laughs> you, and I, even at that point, I had to read up on her because I wasn't, I didn't really know much about her. Right. Um, you got to understand this African child, you know, um, 
people like Judy Garland, Marilyn Monroe, and um, I don't know, Dirk Bogart, were just on television, they were like cartoon characters. Mm. Okay, we love them, we think, but they were not real. Not real people. Yeah. Exactly, but in the West, you knew they were real. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. I mean, they could have been just cartoon characters, just really good humanoids. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and yet, you took me into this character, and you made me actually think of her, be her in her songs, which was fantastic. And then you made me happy, talky, talky, happy talk. <laughs> <laughs> talk about things you like to do. I loved it. And, you know, I, I mean, like you said, you kind of stripped everything and found Patty mm. and made her into Bloody Mary. Well, the, the Bally High is of course a fantastic song but that was that was very moving for yeah. people wasn't it yes. uh, the, you know the message I find it song. very very moving yeah I found it I I, I came close to crying every night mm. when I was singing that and and that's what you know you brought out of me oh good that's Sorry. what you brought out of me and that's why I really wanted to to you know bring you in to speak to me today because uh, I hadn't thought of any director I wanted to invite. Oh. And I also wanted to find out a lot about what you do with the steam industry. Well, the main thing that we do these days is um, I, uh, I've made a living in the arts because when I was very young, um, I was able to, I used to sneak off and go to the theatre on a Saturday afternoon, it was 75p, and um, see these great plays and these great actors. And it was almost like a, a second s schooling for me. I think I learned more going to the theatre than I did perhaps in everyday lessons. So I wanted to create something which gave young people the same sort of opportunity that you could go and see a play and it to be very relaxed. Um, so I wanted to create a theatre space where it would be free for people to come and take a chance and, and perhaps see something that they, they'd never heard of before. But also where no one need feel intimidated or that they had to dress up or that they had to um, behave in a certain way. So we've got this beautiful 800 seat amphitheatre on the banks of the 800? Thames. 800? Yeah. Wow. And it's adjacent to City Hall and um, yes, uh, hundreds of people will uh, come along each night and sit down and, and, and watch a play and you can look along a row and you can see uh, like uh, people from the city, uh, homeless people, seniors, young kids and they all sit together in the moonlight and watch uh, a classic play, and it's a, it's a um, it, it's a wonderful experience, and it's something that I'm very uh, proud it's, of. It's not in the open air. Yeah. Bill, what about the weather in 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 London? Yeah, well, I know, but uh, there's something nice about releasing those plays, those big, for instance, those big Greek tragedies, and opening them up to the elements, because that's when how they would originally <laughs> be performed. Seriously, yeah. that is true, actually. I love watching. Um, we do a lot of comedy, but when we do the big tragedies, uh, I love watching them in the rain because it becomes like a movie and the water's <laughs> dripping down the actors' faces and they're going through all these big emotions. So oh, I quite like that. I quite like the weather thing. But what about the costumes? Did they get... Well, we wash, we, you know, we, <laughs> they come off stage and we the... wash them and dry them. But, uh... <laughs> so do you, have to, do you have to adjust the costumes to the weather? I mean, you know what I mean, so that they, they're not ruined or... Well, it's, it is actually, because August is such a variable month, mm -hmm. uh, you can have, like, blistering sunshine and cold and wet. Uh, so, for instance, I remember when we did um, the Ring Cycle Place, which is based on Nordic mythology, and we had all these kind of big Game of Thrones costumes and kind of all this fur, and, and um, we were dying of the heat in the first few weeks. And then by the end of the run, of course, we were really grateful because it, 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 it started cold. raining and it got cold. Yeah. Good heavens, what, we, we, <laughs> where, where does your, how does your brain wor work? I mean, you take on things that a lot of directors I've worked with would not even touch. Not that you take them on, you actually create them yourself. And you love it. I mean, this is the thing, listening to you, you're loving this. <laughs> <laughs> Watching your play rained on, most people will be absolutely horrified. Well, I love, I've always loved stories and storytelling. Um, I, I, I know you're the same, that, that, that the joy of listening to a great story and being caught up in it, uh, similarly for me, um, if I can tell a story really well and really vividly and 
and take people to places in their minds that they've never gone never to. Never gone to. That's such a uh, such a joy to do, and I'm so lucky to be able to make a living doing that. You know, that's it's going to be totally necessary because technology is taking people from that. In, okay, what I find with internet, looking at the young people, is that they're being told, mm. being told, being told. I, mean, I suppose television did that even before technology came. It's being told. But what you're doing is taking people, like you said, letting their imagination run mm. wild. There's a quote I love, the, the playwright WBH, and he said, he said uh, the theater is a place where the mind goes to be liberated. And oh, how, how wonderful wow. is that? And if that you get a chance amazing. to help people free their minds for a couple of hours and, and, yeah, not look down at a screen and experience watching a story with hundreds of people so you get that kind of collective response. Um, that, that's always been very special to me and that's, that's what I like to do in my work. Do you know, it's, it's because I always said that to be an entertainer, because when people say to me, how do you describe yourself? I say, an entertainer. Mm. And they go, why entertainer? You're a singer. I said, because an entertainer's job is you're doing a public ser service, mm. okay? Because for that hour, two hours that you're on stage, your job is to take them out of their yeah. mundane life, whether they love you, hate you, cry, laugh, it doesn't matter. Yeah. What you do is just take them, let them forget that pro the problems they've had for two hours. Mm. And that's what, what you're describing to me feels like. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, certainly that, that, that's... Yeah. That's what excites me about about storytelling. It's fantastic. Oh, you know, I mean, I I am getting from you this. I, I want to come now. <laughs> <laughs> I want to come. It's a long way from me because I live in Buckinghamshire. All oh, right, yeah. But you know, I want to now come and see the show and see a show and, and just live it in the well, outside. Yeah. I'm trying to imagine it, and 800 people. And they're business people, they're homeless people, there are, wow. I and mean, that is theater like it used to be. And little kids, uh, they'll because we usually do a, fa a family show and then a classic show, and, and um, you know, little kids will come and see the, the, um, the family show and they'll nag their parents to stay on for their classics. For the and classics. so it's a lovely feeling that each season, hundreds of, of kids have watched a classical play, which they, they might never think they'd enjoy. Do you use the same actors for... Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's important. And I always uh, impress upon the acting company that the family show is every bit as important and must be respected in the same way that they respect the classical text. Because um, kids are the, are, the, are the best audience, but also the toughest audience. Oh, yeah. Is, it's got to be truthful. But if you create something truthful, then they'll really they go on will, the journey with yeah, you. Yeah, because they have, no, they have no sides, do they? No. They just, they just move with the spirit. They yeah. live in the spirit. Yeah. And that is, oh, whoa, I love this. It's fantastic. I wasn't expecting this, you know, actually interviewing you to get this. Right now, I feel all tingling. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what I used to get working with you. Even when we did um, the show about the Scott Fitzgerald. and Z yeah, yeah beautiful, um, and, beautiful damned. and damned even when we did that I remember um, yes I remember your note one day <laughs> it was quite hysterical because I had actually put on a mask on stage because <laughs> the lighting was so it was poor mm. and I felt it I could feel it because you look down at your skin you think nobody can see me really nobody can see me mm. and then you know um my husband Stephen said you can hardly be seen you're like a shadow and i thought that's it i'm putting on a mask right right <laughs> and then i remember you i don't know if you remember this your note you said patty what was that makeup about <laughs> <laughs> ah yes <laughs> i'll never forget that well i learned a lot know? about um uh making uh uh, black performers look great from that because it, I mean I must confess it's not something that had struck me and no, I, w I wasn't the lighting designer of course but um, when you pointed it out I could see exactly what you meant and I, I you know f since that time I've I've taken that forward and into other shows you're kidding me I thought the great Phil Wilmot something oh. <laughs> it's wonderful and I, I just I hope that I can work with you again yeah no, seriously we'll because something. you know I don't know yeah the, it, when you think of another Judy Garland perhaps maybe the song <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's time to Marilyn Monroe <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 
people don't. That is so funny. Me as Marilyn Monroe. I love that. But you know, I mean, it's been, it's just been wonderful talking to you. And I've, I've been looking forward to seeing you, you know, many years. And finally, this show has brought us together. Well, it's lovely to be here. And, and I thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. God bless you for being here. Now, you've listened to what Phil has to say. You know, there's no point in being inside the box. Just, just wait for your turn, okay? Go outside the box, look, search. Just do what your heart tells you and be yourself. And God bless you. We'll see you next week. <laughs>